Okay, I guess this is part two of Union with God. So I just finished talking about Meister Eckhart and how he considered the uh, Christian mystic must become uh, completely spiritually impoverished in order to gain union with God. Because that spiritual impoverishment, that emptying of oneself is the only thing that will allow God to completely indwell the believer, to completely fill the, the spiritual cup of the believer. It's... So, what are some other examples? Another example is from John of the Cross. John of the Cross was of the camp that believed that the union with God was much more than just the intertwining of the spirit of the believer with the spirit of God. Union with God, according to John of the Cross, meant a homogeneous union, like two rivers or a tributary running into a large river, and the waters intermingle until they are indistinguishable from each other. Thus, the spirit of the Christian becomes intertwined with the spirit of God such that they cannot be distinguished one from the other. Again, this is a belief I have never heard of in the modern days. I'd like to know if it still exists. This is John of the Cross from the late 16th century. Here's what he has to say. As in the consummation of carnal marriage, there are two in one flesh, as scripture says, so also in the consummation of spiritual marriage between God and the soul, there are two natures in one spirit and love, as we learn from St. Paul, who made use of the same comparison, saying, He who adheres to our Lord is one spirit with him. That's from 1 Corinthians 6.17. So, when the light of a star or of a candle is united to that of the sun, the light is not that of the star, nor of the candle, but of the sun itself, which absorbs all other light in its own. Uh, he goes on to say, the two natures, that is the nature of God and the nature of the believer, the two natures are so united, what is divine is so communicated to what is human, that without undergoing any essential change, each seems to be God. Yet, in this life, the union cannot be perfect, though it can neither be described nor conceived. So, according to John of the Cross, the spirit of the believer becomes so overwhelmed or so enveloped or so consumed by the spirit of God, much like throwing a candle into the sun, that, uh, as John of the Cross says, the spirit of the human seems to be that of the spirit of God. Now, for my money, there's not much of a difference between saying that and just saying uh, what, what was said in the previous section uh, on deification, that the spirit of the believer becomes so indwelled with the spirit of God, so homogenized with that spirit, that the spirit of the believer does become divine. Um, and that's uh, the beginning of a lot of mischief. A lot of believers, a lot of uh, believers in that century and centuries uh, since believe that they will ultimately become divine, ultimately become God. Um, I wonder if uh, the beliefs of the Mormons, for instance, uh, don't have their roots. Well, I know a lot of the roots came from uh, Mason, Masonic uh, ideas, things like that. But I wonder if some of those roots didn't ultimately come from... 13th century mystics like John of the Cross, like uh, Meister Eckhart, uh, when the spirit becomes divine? Uh, maybe, I don't know. It's just an interesting question. Well, not everybody thought that. A lot of these beliefs, like I said, did become condemned as heresy uh, in, in later years. So people that did not go that far were, for instance, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, who said that the spirit of God and the spirit of 
man, of, of the believer, while intertwined, still maintain their, their ontological distinction. Uh, here's a bit what he has to say. This is Bernard of Clairvaux, early 12th century. <clears throat> I would say that man is blessed and holy to whom it is given to experience something of this sort, so rare in life, even if it but be once and for the space of a moment, to lose yourself as if you no longer existed, to cease completely to experience yourself, to reduce yourself to nothing is not a human sentiment, but a divine experience. If any mortal suddenly rapt, as has been said, and for a moment is admitted to this, immediately the world of sin envies him, the evil of the day disturbs him, the mortal body weighs him down, the needs of the flesh bother him, the weakness of corruption offers no support, and sometimes with greater violence than these, brotherly love calls him back. Alas, he has to come back to himself, to descend again into his being, and wretchedly cry out, Lord, I suffer violence, adding, Unhappy man that I am, who will free me from this body doomed to death? So the question I have when reading something like this, where the, the believer, the Christian mystic, cries out to God to take the believer out of a life of suffering, uh, are these people actually in pain? Are they suffering some physical torment? And they're longing to empty themselves, to gain union with God. Uh, it's possible. I'm not sure. I mean, this is in the day before modern medicine. Uh, they didn't have much hope of, of painkillers like we have. So is this a, a cry to, uh, for help for God to swallow them? Uh, is union with God a way of alleviating the pain, emptying yourself of, of all physical torments like physical suffering? so that the indwelling of God can fully envelop, fully overwhelm the spirit of the believer? Maybe so. Well, there's one other I'd like to read if I can get time, and that's a Dutch mystic, John Rusbroek, from his little book of enlightenment. Uh, apparently, this was a very, very popular uh, uh, book, translated into many different languages, but he preached that uh, while many of the mystics, such as Meister Eckhart, preached an indistinct union with God, he tried to preach something of a, of a, of a compromise. Can we be fully united with God and yet remain distinct from him? And I'm not sure if I'm going to have time to say, read this all, but um, he says things like, uh, These enlightened people are lifted up with free mind above reason to a bare vision devoid of images. There lives the eternal invitation of God's unity, and with imageless, naked understanding they go beyond all works and all practices and all things to the summit of their spirit. So this is what union with God means. But, soon after, uh, John backpedals. Nevertheless, the creature does not become God, for the union occurs by means of grace and love returned to God. And for this reason, the creature experiences distinction and alterity between itself and God in its inward vision. So he's saying, despite this union with God, uh, the spirit of the believer does not become God. There is a distinction between the two. So a lot of people were advancing the belief that the believer does become divine, or at least the spirit does become God. Um, again, I wonder how this ultimately evolved uh, in the uh, centuries after that. Well, maybe you Mormons might want to chime in on that. If anybody's watching, let me know. I guess that's it. Take care.